Hello, everybody, and thank you to the organizers for being here. Um, and go gauchos. <laughs> so at first glance, the human brain looks kind of unremarkable, sort of like a three pound squishy walnut. But if you look a little closer at the microscopic level, you'll see that it contains multitudes, over 85 billion neurons that are wired together into precise neural circuits. And together, these neural circuits can give rise to complex repertoire of behaviors. Um, and, and that's really what I want to talk about today. Because if you think about it, this lump can compose an opera. It can debate the fundamental principles of democracy. It can even invent tools that allow us to see into the deepest corners of space. Even more profoundly, the human brain can invent tools to see and study itself. When President Obama launched the Human Brain Initiative in 2013, he said that understanding how the brain works is one of the greatest scientific challenges of our time. Right? It's the moonshot of our generation. It may end up being a little bit harder than landing on the moon, given that there are more synaptic connections in a single human brain than there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Around the world, neuroscientists are trying to crack the neural code to understand how this gives rise to the mind, and to identify therapeutic solutions to devastating diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. If we have any hope of meeting these challenges, we need the best minds at the table and in the lab inventing radically new ways of seeing, probing, and understanding the brain. And that's what I want to talk about today. So this is a famous photograph that was taken at the Solvay Conference in Belgium uh, in 1927. Uh, the conference included 29 uh, attendees that you see here, including scientific luminaries like Einstein, Schrodinger, and Heisenberg. When I first saw this photograph, I was struck by two conflicting sentiments. First, I was amazed that such an assembly of brilliant scientists could be gathered together in a single intimate meeting of the minds. But I was also disappointed at the faces that are missing. What do you see when you look at this photograph? <laughs> of the 29 attendees that you see here, 28 were men of European origin. Only the famed Marie Curie broke precedent. And while this, this group of scientists compiled an incredible list of scientific achievements, one can only imagine how much more would have been accomplished had women and ethnic minorities been allowed greater access to their ranks. As the historian and paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould said, I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. Today, most science departments are more diverse than the Solvay Conference in 1927, but not by much. There is still significant progress to make. This graph shows the percent of female faculty in various departments at Harvard University in 2017, where give or take four out of five faculty are men. Now this is a pattern that is reflected in the hallways across major academic institutions. Um, and in the interest of time, I won't go through the long history of explicit discrimination that's kept women and other minorities out of higher education. Other writers and scholars have chronicled those uncomfortable parts of America's past. Instead, in this talk, I want to take a step back to examine the implicit biases and stereotypes that can impede girls' access to STEM from the very beginning. What does a scientist look like? Well, that question has been asked to generations of students. In 1970, less than 1% of children who were asked to draw a scientist drew a woman. Today, about 30% do. In another study, uh, children were shown a picture of a man and a woman, and they were asked to point to the most intelligent one. Now, four and five-year-olds tend to choose their own heart, or their own sex, um, but by age six and beyond, girls are more and more likely to choose the man. 
And girls who endorse a gender stereotype about brilliance are then more likely to decline playing games described as for really smart kids. These biases are affecting children's choices at heartbreakingly young ages. And over time, these are the kinds of early social developmental drivers that can lead to the underrepresentation of women in STEM. And more bad news before we get to the good news. <laughs> For the um, students and the educators in the room, uh, it doesn't stop at graduation. So this, um, this graph is from a study published in 2012 where researchers sent fake resumes to science faculty around the country. This was uh, for a job application for a lab manager position, which is often a springboard into competitive MD and PhD programs. Now, these resumes were fake, although, of course, the faculty didn't know it. And they were identical, except for a single word at the top of the page. The first name of the applicant was randomly assigned to be male or female. And what do you think happened? Faculty judged the male applicant to be significantly more competent and more hireable than the identical female applicant. And when pushed to come up with a starting salary, females were offered $4,000 less. This isn't the result of a few individuals with antiquated attitudes. This is the result of widespread implicit beliefs. So here's the crux of the problem. Right? Advocating for diversity in science is not just a social justice issue. It's not just the right thing to do. Diversity makes science better. Right? It drives innovation, it challenges the status quo, and it can change the very nature of the questions we think to ask. Here's one example. In the biomedical sciences, researchers rely on animal models to understand disease, to test therapeutic treatments, and to understand basic biological properties. What you may not realize is that the bulk of this research is conducted in male animals. That fact was discovered and quantified by Annalise Beery when she was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley. Now, she had a hunch that this was a case, but nobody had ever quantified the magnitude of the problem until she came along. She did an exhaustive literature review, published a groundbreaking report that documented what is now referred to as this sex bias in basic science. So what she shows is across the biomedical sciences, in neuroscience, immunology, physiology, cancer biology, there's an over-reliance on male animals. This is even true for animal models of human disorders that are more prevalent in women, like anxiety, depression, and Alzheimer's disease. This bias has affected the health and compromised the health of women in ways we are just beginning to understand. Last year, 18 of the 20 drugs that were pulled from the market were done so because of adverse effects in women. Effects that might have been discovered had this preclinical testing included both sexes. What's at stake here is not just the health of women, but the health of our economy, which is suffering under the enormous and ballooning, spiraling costs of healthcare. Here's the good news. Beery's work started a movement. And by 2016, the National Institutes of Health, under the leadership of Janine Clayton, rolled out a series of policy changes and funding initiatives to ensure that future studies are balanced by sex. This was a huge step forward to ensuring that men and women benefit equally from our research studies. And it's not lost on me that women played a critical role in this paradigm shift. Beery saw something that nobody else saw. She challenged a convention that had been passed on for decades. And in that moment, she made an indelible mark on science. I'll give a couple more examples that hit a little closer to home because they come from my own field of cognitive neuroscience, where I would argue that our studies tend to overlook aspects of the human condition that are relevant to at least half the world's population. So I'm going to give a little bit of insight into what my lab here at UC Santa Barbara does um, to understand uh, menopause, uh, menstrual cycle, and birth control, and how it shapes the brain. So first, menopause. 
So a major driving question within human neuroscience is what happens to the brain when it ages? The convention in my field is to take a group of 65-year-olds and older and to compare their brain structure and function to a group of young adults, and usually you guys, right, college undergraduates or soon-to-be college undergraduates. But that number, 65, is a historical quirk. It's based on the average retirement age of U.S. wage earners. It's not based in biology. There's nothing magical that happens at 65. And you could argue, from a woman's health perspective, that it's an absurd age to choose because half of the world's population goes through one of the most profound neuroendocrine changes of her life a decade prior, right? Menopause. We have very little understanding about how this major decline in the production of ovarian hormones shapes the brain. And this is troubling, given that by some estimates, women are at twice the risk of Alzheimer's and other dementias, age-related disorders. So here at UCSB, my lab is trying to take a step back to understand the normative changes that happen to the brain during this uh, midlife transition, right? this uncharted decade. And in work conducted um, by my graduate student, Xu Ying Yu, she just quantified these biases that we have in the field. And so this graph is showing the number of neuroimaging papers that have been published over the last 20 years that follow that conventional model of looking at chronological aging. And there's been thousands of publications. And if you squint, you can see this orange line down at the bottom. And those are the handful, dozens even, of studies that have bothered to look at menopause and that the effects of menopause on the brain. So you can see there's significant progress to make to ensure that the kinds of questions that we're asking benefit women and men alike. Here's another example, right? The menstrual cycle. So, you know, you might have guessed my lab is really interested in hormones in the brain. Um, we look at neuroendocrinology. And so just to give you a little primer into neuroendocrine, uh, the field of neuroendocrinology, uh, um, the brain is an endocrine organ, right? So we have these glands throughout our bodies that produce hormones. Hormones travel through our bloodstream, past the blood-brain barrier, and bind to receptors in the brain. So you, think, you can think of receptors like the catcher's mitt, right, and the ball like the hormone. And we know in particular that these hormone receptors, so receptors for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, these are called the sex steroid hormones, these sit in critical areas of the brain that are responsible for learning and memory, like the prefrontal cortex, so right behind your forehead, the hippocampus, and the cerebellum, which you'll see, learn about in a moment. We know from animal studies that these hormones can shape brain structure and function. And yet at the human level, there's been a real lack of studies to systematically examine their effects. And in one of the most egregious examples of sort of uh, you know, a study that should have been done decades ago but hasn't, was really trying to understand how over um, the menstrual cycle, in naturally cycling females, we have this um, cyclic ebb and flow of these hormones. Do, are there changes in the brain that follow that time course of the reproductive cycle? This question hadn't been done, and so a graduate student in my lab, Laura Pritchett, took it upon herself to do it uh, to herself in a very Marie Curie moment of self-experimentation. Um, and so every single day for 30, 28 plus days, she had a daily blood draw and underwent a daily brain scan to understand how the, this ebb and flow of hormones affected her own brain. And so what you're seeing here is just every single day of this study, um, which maps onto a day of her menstrual cycle. And this is the canonical ebb and flow of hormones. So this is showing estradiol, which is the main form of estrogen in mammals like us. And there's this peak. So you see this 12-fold increase right around the day of ovulation and then this dramatic drop and progesterone, so here are her levels mapped against a population average in gray. And you can see that she shows this dramatic change, an 800-fold increase in progesterone in the last two weeks of the menstrual cycle. She's totally normal. This is like textbook, picture-perfect um, hormones. So next, we turn to her brain imaging data. And in analyses led by her and a postdoctoral fellow named Tyler Santander, 
they wanted to understand how the ebb and flow of hormones affected aspects of brain function. And what they show is that increases in estradiol over time are associated with greater functional connectivity across the whole brain. Here's the kicker, right? Women make up 50% of study populations within the neuroimaging world, obviously about 50% of the world's population, and yet less than one-tenth of one percent of human neuroimaging papers consider endocrine factors in their design. We are missing essential features that shape the brain. In an extension uh, of this work, uh, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Caitlin Taylor, was interested in how this ebb and flow of hormones affects brain structure. So Laura was looking at aspects of brain function, and Caitlin is now looking at brain structure. And what she did is develop, she used this high resolution um, image, just looking at a slice through the brain to, uh, to look at the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is really critical for memory. And here she is, this is the beautiful hippocampus, and it's not one homogenous structure. It can actually be broken down into these subfields. And what we can see here in this sort of submillimeter resolution are these subfields of the hippocampus. And what Caitlin found is that over the menstrual cycle, some of these subfields actually ebb and flow. So what she's showing here is data from the entorhinal cortex, which is this uh, region shown here. And in the last two weeks of the menstrual cycle, when progesterone levels skyrocket, you actually see um, uh, this area of the brain diminish in size. And presumably, this is happening every single cycle, right? This is a feature of our brains. What's particularly intriguing to us is that the entorhinal cortex is the first region of the brain to show neuropathology in the progression to Alzheimer's disease. And here she's showing early evidence of hormonal regulation of this region. So we are just scratching the surface. But if we can have more scientists asking these sorts of questions, maybe we'll get a step closer to understanding why women are disproportionately affected by the disease. And the third and final example, um, also led by Dr. Taylor, is this question of birth control. Right? So if we're on the topic of hormones in the brain, you can ask, what about the manipulation of hormones that happens in the kinds of medications that we ingest, not just the hormones that our bodies produce naturally? And the most common hormone-based medication used around the world is the pill, right? the birth control pill. Um, so 100 million women around the world, 10 million women right here in the United States are on some form of oral hormonal contraceptives, and yet we have very little understanding about what uh, chronic suppression of sex steroid hormones, which is achieved through taking the pill, what that does to the human brain. Um, so Caitlin set out to, to gather critical preliminary evidence to understand this question. And in a sample of about 100 individuals, she finds differences in the volume of the cerebellum, which is another region of the brain that's densely expressed with estrogen receptors. This region of the brain differs between users of the pill and never users of the pill. And if you look within users, the longer they've been on it, the more dramatic the change. So this, you know, I don't want you to leave, you know, leave with the impression that the birth control is bad. In fact, I would argue the opposite. The pill is amazing. And not to get too political, but I would argue that the birth control is probably the most important invention of human history because it gave women, for the first time in human history, control over their own reproductive function, which led to entry into the workforce and economic independence, right? We love the birth control pill. That doesn't mean that we've asked all the critical basic science questions necessary to understand if the cur current version of this hormone-regulating pill is safe and effective. We need more and better research. And to do that, uh, Dr. Taylor and I and the lab um, decided that we can't go it alone. And we can't do small-scale studies because this is of importance to, again, half the world's population. So we are uh, gathering together um, all of the University of California uh, campuses to create the University of California Women's Brain Initiative. And we're pooling brain imaging data from all of these uh, campuses so that we can have, for the first time, 
a large-scale brain imaging consortium that is dedicated solely to women's health research, an underserved and undermet need within the neurosciences. So <laughs> I think this begs a question that, um, you know, scientists cannot answer questions that we don't see, right? And it's likely that for a field like cognitive neuroscience that has been traditionally led by men, menopause, menstrual cycle, birth control pill, these were not visible, right? Just like it didn't seem strange to only study male animals in the lab until somebody comes along and questions those ingrained assumptions. So what are all the other questions we can't see because we lack the experience to even imagine them? Science has to represent society, especially since the bulk of our academic funding comes from you, from taxpayer dollars, right? We need a pool of scientists who bring radically new perspectives to the lab. And if history is any evidence, when women gain a voice, and when we step into positions of power, it can transform science. I can only hope that when uh, people of future generations look back on a photograph of the most influential scientists from the present day, they see a group of faces that more faithfully represent our social makeup as a whole. And if they do, I think our moonshot may be in reach. Thank you. Thank you.